Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. In the U.S., civic nationalism is the state religion. In Christ's Sermon on the Mount, he spoke of a city on a hill. A 17th century white colonial settler referred to the Massachusetts Bay Colony as a city on a hill. In the 1980s, President Reagan referred to America as the shining city on a hill. America venerates a collection of prophets and calls them the Founding Fathers, treating the documents they wrote as if they were the Ten Commandments received in immaculate form from a deity. A new generation, born after Reagan died, is coming to realize that this shine was always a mirage, thanks to the Dobbs decision of the Supreme Court, which overturned Roe and a woman's right to choose. How is it, we wonder, that judges arbitrarily chosen by presidents who didn't even win the popular vote are appointed for life and can overturn rights we've taken for granted since the 1970s? Our system does indeed seem brilliantly designed, but to usurp the popular will and to maintain the power of entrenched elites. To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Aziz Rana, a professor of law at Cornell University, author of the book The Two Faces of American Freedom, and an expert on American constitutional law and political development, with a particular focus on how shifting notions of race, citizenship, and empire have shaped legal and political identity since the country's founding. Aziz, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I'm so happy that we got to do this. I have so many questions for you. So I guess let's just jump right into it. Um, as we all know, the role of the Supreme Court has come under great scrutiny uh, in recent weeks and months after Democrats, you know, feigned shock over the decision to reverse Roe, which has been quite devastating already. Um, so I guess, you know, the first question I want to ask you is, is it not fundamentally like anti-democratic to give so much power for life to these nine judges, unelected, just appointed by presidents? Absolutely. So, you know, I should say that I'm a I'm a little de-Democrat. I'm generally suspicious of judicial review, the idea that unelected judges should have the ability to strike down laws that are passed by elected representatives. Uh, but that doesn't mean that in all circumstances, I would oppose having some kind of cabin system of judicial review. I think that really depends on the, the set of institutions a country has, the, the background, cultural and political context. But the version of judicial review in the U.S. is extreme, and it's truly an outlier. And you can just think of this by going through its various elements. So we have a Supreme Court with nine justices that serve for life, that have the ability to strike down laws that are the product of democratic decision making, and that enjoy no meaningful ethical oversight. And if you take every single one of these elements, it's really striking how different it is than what you'd get elsewhere. So serving for life, most countries that have a system of judicial review have some kind of term limit combined with age limits. Um, so for instance, in India, there's an age limit of 65. In Germany, it's 68 along with a 12 year term. The number of justices, this is an incredibly small number of justices, nine. India has 34. Germany again has 16. The review system, it's also quite common to have review where there's some type of legislative override. So there's some capacity for elected institutions to override the decisions, let's say by repassing laws or some other framework. And then of course, some type of, uh, of ethics oversight. So the US doesn't have any of that. Effectively, what it means is if you put all of these things together, it is an incredibly, perhaps globally unique, powerful judiciary. And then that's combined with something else that's rarely discussed when thinking about the nature of the American Supreme Court, which is that the U.S., unlike the rest of the world, also has perhaps the hardest amendment process. So what happens elsewhere is not only do you have a more cabin version of judicial power, it's also much more flexible and easy to pass amendments that would change the Constitution in ways that are responsive to popular majorities. So you can have a popular majority through legislature that, let's say, gets majority support over multiple elections or two-thirds support, and then it goes to a national referendum where all you would need would be 50 percent, and you have a new constitutional amendment. In the U.S., you need two-thirds of both houses of Congress combined with three-fourths of the states, which basically makes the amendment process a dead letter. Mm 
And what that does is it funnels all of constitutional politics into the court. So you essentially limit the capacity for popular majorities to exercise authority of the Constitution, and then you funnel decision making into a court that is globally unique for the amount of power that it has. Mm. Wow, it sounds so democratic. <laughs> and I'm being very sarcastic when I say that. And before we get into some of the more like nuts and bolts of it, I wanted to, I was wondering, you know, when it comes to Republicans, they seem to be so much more skilled at using the courts and really weaponizing the judiciary and their democratic counterparts. You know, they block Democrats from appointing judges and then they force their people in. And then, you know, evangelicals voted for Trump, even though he was like morally reprehensible to them. Um, even those Republicans who hated Trump voted for him because he would put right wing uh, judges in the system and their votes you know, ultimately did pay off. Uh, and, you know, Republicans really don't seem to care at all about being accused of hypocrisy. They know they know the goal of power is to wield it right to achieve your agenda, whereas Democrats still try so hard to strive for this like delusional bipartisanship instead of recognizing that politics is this like struggle for power. So why do you think they do this? Like, why do you think Democrats continuously surrender power to this party that represents such a minority of people? Yeah, I mean, so I, th I think there are a couple of things that are going on. So the first is, I think you're absolutely right that the Democratic Party has remained much more sort of committed to a, a now really no longer appropriate vision of the country and the world. In other words, an idea that we're still marked by kind of Cold War, mid-century centrist compact where you can find agreement across the aisle. You can be, uh, you can disagree without being disagreeable. And I think that that's shaped a lot of Democratic Party policy and approach. Um, you can certainly see this in the early years of the o Obama administration, 2008 to 2010. But, you know, I also think, especially more recently, that a large part of what's going on has to do with the, the actual incentives of the system in ways that can't necessarily be entirely laid at the feet of the strategic choices made by the Democratic Party leadership. And by this, I mean that it's not just that the court wields extreme power with a broken amendment process to boot. It's that the entire system of representation in the U.S. is fundamentally undemocratic and dysfunctional because of the extent to which it's based on state-based representation. And that means that you have pockets of the country that are wildly out of step demographically in terms of cultural values with where the majority of the country is, enjoys really, you know, um, dramatically outsized authority over decision making. And this is through the Senate, which is based on state-based representation, the presidency through the Electoral College, where you can lose the popular vote but win the presidency, the House of Representatives, where the first-past-the-post system, along with single-member districts, um, further sort of insulates a minority coalition. Now, what this does is in a context in which you're a member of a party, this is the Republican Party, where really over the last 30 years, you're losing the battle of ideas. Your views are minority ideas. The incentives of the system say you have two choices. One, you could change your ideas to actually get a majority, or you can take advantage of all of these tools to be able to sustain generational power. And the decision basically made within the Republican Party is to take advantage of these tools, in particular the courts, as a way of projecting generational power. And this is a long-term problem of the constitutional system. The story of authoritarianism in the US is a story of empowered minorities, oftentimes white minorities like after Reconstruction, who take advantage of the tools embedded in the system to project their power even though they don't have majority support. And so essentially we have a situation where on the one hand, you have a Democratic Party leadership that has been really slow on the uptake, has basically been a leadership out of time until quite recently, sort of imagines that the country is still essentially democratic, it's still marked by a Cold War compact. And then on the other hand, you have a party, the Republican Party, that understands multiracial democracy as a kind of existential threat and sees the tools of minority rule and really a kind of white authoritarian rule as the mechanism for maintaining power. And it's the intersection of those two dynamics that produces the present moment. 
Yeah. And I guess that can explain why the court has drifted so far to the right when the population has drifted so far to the left. And of course, within that is like the politics, right? Because, you know, the Supreme Court in so many ways is like this kind of super legislature because it has the power to determine which laws can and can't be passed by the actual legislature that's elected to government. And I guess given the importance of these issues, you know, politicians are going to inevitably seek to influence the court's composition, which is why you've had so much money poured into an issue like, for example, abortion, right? Like trying to get these right wing judges appointed. So it's kind of like, why would they act in any other way? But then on that front, like on that note, understanding that aspect of it, then you have this Supreme Court that is divided, right? You've got the, the liberals, the so-called liberal justices, and then the right wing conservative justices. And they have such diametrically opposed views, yet they're so chummy. Like mm -hmm. they basically say, oh, we're like, they're good people. But right, like, how can they be so chummy when they are literally for such different things? Or maybe they're not, you know, maybe the things they're, you know, they're for and against aren't actually that different when it comes down to the foundational aspects of the country. Yeah. I mean, so I think the chumminess is actually, I mean, I think it's real. I mean, so this is one of the things that you persistently hear from the the so-called liberal wing of the court. So this is, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was presumably very close friends with Scalia. Um, if you hear um, uh, uh, Sotomayor speak, she talks about the importance of camaraderie among the court that nobody else in sense outside of the court really understands the specific nature of what it is to be, you know, one of the, the nine justices. And, you know, I think it highlights the extent to which those that are on the court from center left to far right, in a deep sense, do share a particular account of American power and American meaning, American exceptionalism. And they understand themselves as linked in a, in a very similar project. At least they have, you know, his, historically through all, all of the years that we're kind of been court watchers. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this is significant is because at the end of the day, all of these judges are effectively agents of the state. They're state officials that are that have drunk deeply from the well of uh, American power and American exceptionalism and are committed to projecting that power both domestically and internationally in the types of opinions that they end up producing. And that chumminess has real policy implications. So if you have a world like we do, where all constitutional politics more or less gets funneled into a court with extreme power, then what that means is that the people that are on the court set the terms for what amounts to reform. Like the very idea of like what should be changed about American life is shaped by what they think should be changed about American life. And they have a specific account based on their education, their political sensibilities, their connections to each other about what views are you know, essentially off the wall versus responsible, respectable opinions. And you can see this play out in a ton of different ways. So just take, for example, debates over race. Mm -hmm. That the last few years, the country has been roiled by questions about racial justice and the kind of structural features of white supremacy that persist in the country. A lot of that has been tied to the nature of the American carceral state, the ways in which race and class intersect to produce um, generational subordination. Yet note, very little of that conversation has been a litigation conversation that has anything to do with the Constitution that appears in the courts. What instead has the court been obsessed with when it comes to the question of race? Affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just take a step back, the idea that affirmative action regardless of your views about it, so I'm a supporter of affirmative action, really goes to the heart of the question of race in America is absurd. But it's that we've essentially given over power, not, over, not only over constitutional politics, but over what counts as an appropriate reform conversation to this very small coterie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I also wanted to just note something separately about where you started, which is the, you know, the fact that the court has drifted to the extreme right, just as popular opinion has shifted to the left. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of useful to think a little bit about the difference between this moment with Dobbs overturning Roe versus Wade and 30 years ago. So 1992, Roe v. Wade came up before the courts and the case was called Casey and a split court ultimately ended up 
upholding the central holding of Roe, while at the same time also upholding a vast array of restrictions on uh, on reproductive rights. So it was a kind of split decision um, between reproductive rights and anti-abortion activists. The thing to me that is really striking about that moment is that if you just counted the number of justices on the court, eight of the nine were appointed by Republicans. And the one person that was not appointed by a Republican white had been appointed by Kennedy and was actually opposed to, to Roe v. Wade. So what was the difference? I think a really significant part of the difference was the nature of the Republican Party at that moment. So the Republican Party really over the previous 25 years before then, from the late 60s to the early 90s, was the majority party in the country. Its ideas, I, you know, disagree with them, were ascendant. It had had politicians like Reagan and Nixon that were some of the most popular politicians in the country. They were pop politicians out of the most populous state in the country, California. They won landslide reelections in 72 and 84. And the fact that the Republican Party could claim a kind of majority status for its ideas and its institutions against the backdrop of a, a kind of Cold War agreement, too, between center left and center right, meant that the court, in a way, was reflective of where that coalition was, its plurality. And you can see this expressed in the variety of perspectives on the bench. In a way, precisely because the Republican Party has lost the battle of ideas, Mm -hmm. It what's happened is that during the period when it declined as a majority party, the court became really central to instantiating its ideological agenda in a way that could sustain generational authority, even though it doesn't have popular support. And so the party, in a way, ends up investing in minority rule precisely in the moments when it doesn't have majority support. And this is a dynamic that I think is a peculiar feature of American authoritarianism, which is the constitutional system ends up facilitating an often white, again, authoritarian politics precisely at the moments in which you have slipping actual majority authority over political life. Wow, that's yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. And, you know, you mentioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, of course, had this like crazy cult of personality around her. Um, there was even like a Hollywood film about her. She became big in pop culture, uh, especially during the Trump era. Um, and then after she died, um, to really make her seem like cool, which I mean, come on, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you could say a lot about her, but she was never cool. It's just kind of funny that now she's like, so she became like a cool person, but regardless, um, you know, in 2011, Harvard law professor Randall Kennedy called for judge Ginsburg and judge Breyer to retire while Obama was still in office. And he said that if Ginsburg stayed in the court, knowing her history of poor health, there was a risk of disaster in which the female Thurgood Marshall will be replaced by a female Clarence Thomas. That's a direct quote. And then, of course, Kennedy was proven right when Trump did, in fact, replace Ginsburg with the extremely conservative Amy Coney Barrett. And so we can, of course, blame this on, you know, Ginsburg's selfish desire to maintain a position of power. I know that's like blasphemy to say that, but... There you go. I said it. Um, and it is crazy to think that like our rights and our so-called democracy, which I appreciate the fact that you brought in the word authoritarian there, but that it's so dependent on the whims and the health of these individual judges. But this kind of does reinforce what you were saying earlier. But is it misguided to focus so much on individual judges and their personalities rather than the institution itself? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's that's generally right, that like we actually have to take a bird's eye view and see how these institutions operate to reproduce specific forms of dysfunction. Now, I will say, you know, this is absolutely part of Ginsburg's legacy. So in 2012, part of the reason why, you know, the call for her to step down is significant is that in 2012, Obama wins re-election and the Democrats have control of the Senate. And this means that there is a period in which she could have stepped down and Obama could have nominated uh, somebody to the Supreme Court uh, that would have been confirmed. Um, so we could have avoided the circumstances that end up occurring when she dies. But I think even though that's part of her legacy, the bigger problem is the nature of an institution that accumulates so much power in individuals. So Ginsburg dies in her 27th year on the court. Scalia dies in his 30th year on the court. 
Uh, Thomas right now is in his 31st year on the court. Uh, Stevens was on the court for 35 years. It's very difficult if you have a particular culture around the court, you have a cult around the court, and you have individuals that trust their own capacities to imagine that folks are going to give up power. That's just not in the nature of how people behave. They imagine that they have a capacity to sort of outlive uh, <laughs> outlive circumstances and also do good while they're in specific institutions, whether or not you agree with their, their particular policies. And so the real problem is an institutional framework that accumulates authority for these individuals over this period of time. And I think the obsession basically around who is on the court and also the centrality of the nomination process, who gets onto the court, what happens when there's an opening, you know, is a sign of real political and democratic ill health in this country. So I've said this before, but I think if, you know, in 10 years, 20 years, we woke up and rather than a cult of personality around Ginsburg or Scalia or name whatever justice you like or, or disapprove of, we honestly didn't know who was on the court. That would be a sign of a much more stable and successful democratic system. And indeed, if you had a politics where let, let's just think about the fall of 2020. So Ginsburg dies at a time when the country is in the midst of a global health pandemic that's generating massive health and economic dislocations. And yet all of the incentives line up for the Republican Party, even though they have a president that's coming up for re-election, to not really pay attention to those massive social problems and pass legislation that's popularly supported, but instead to focus on sort of pushing through a nominee to the Supreme Court. And that yeah, that makes sense. If you're McConnell, what's going to matter more? You know, getting Trump reelected or having, as we've seen, Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court for 30, 40 years. Um, this, again, is yet another indicator of democratic ill health. Yeah. And, you know, the left, I think the left has criticized the Supreme Court in the past when it struck down like progressive legislation passed by Congress. And then they've praised the Supreme Court. Uh, after things like Brown versus Board of Education um, in 1954 was thought to have ended racial segregation in schools. And then the court also guaranteed the right for legal aid for people charged with crimes. Although, of course, that system of public defenders is extremely flawed in practice, as Brown versus Board of Education was. And it did recognize, though, some right to abortion, though that was, of course, severely limited over the years and based all around the right to privacy rather than like you know, women's rights, which don't really exist in the Constitution. Um, then, of course, the left has criticized the court as it swung to the right. So do you think the, the few achievements of the court to which American liberals or the left can point to would have been achieved through other means if the Supreme Court did not exist? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to do the counterfactual. I mean, I'll say that my basic view is that the way that rights protections, critical rights protections, and sort of the expansion of democratic practice in the US has actually been facilitated is overwhelmingly a combination of mass movement politics and legislative achievements. And that's a kind of story that you can tell, you know, legislative achievements about reconstruction, the labor movement in the 1930s and the passage of you know, central pieces of legislation that go to the heart of ensuring that um, workers have critical protections uh, on the job. Uh, the right to vote, the 19th Amendment is a mass movement politics, the civil rights movement's achievements. So Brown versus Board of Education certainly plays a significant role in setting the background context within which mass movement politics plays out, who's viewed as behaving in a way that's constitutional versus unconstitutional in the late 50s, early 1960s. But it's really civil rights strategies, mass movement strategies combined with legislative achievements, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Housing Act, that end up setting the terms for what people think of as a second reconstruction. So that's my general view. I will say, though, that there is a period, and this is the story of the Warren Court, where the court played a significant role in expanding rights frameworks that are critical to criminal defendants, um, to notions of um, uh, racial equality. And then in the early Burger period, so this is the late 60s, early 1970s, this is you know reproductive rights in Roe versus Wade. Uh, 
um, in ways that I think shouldn't be diminished. But here's the thing. That is a product of a very specific and contingent historical moment. In other words, the war in court and its achievements in the 50s, 60s, and then the Burger Court in the early 1970s is a result of the, a combination of factors. So the New Deal, the transformations that took place during the, the Great Depression in the context of mass labor movement organization, the effects of World War II and how World War II transformed domestic white opinion about questions of race and belonging, the Cold War, which created this, this sense of an existential threat that required generating a labor business as well as racial compact at home as a way of ensuring internal unity and also pushed right and left toward a kind of set, set of centrist agreements that were consistent with various types of ameliorative reforms. All of that is a function of very specific dynamics that frankly were not replicated either before in American history or since. And the problem of the liberal embrace of the court in particular is that until very recently, what it did was it took those contingent dynamics and the specific circumstances that gave rise to the war in court in that era, and then transformed it into a general story about how the court has operated in American history. And then also took on board, frankly, from the Cold War period, a deep suspicion of the people, a kind of anti-populist worry that really where threats come from are from mass movements and majority politics. When actually, if you look at all of the rights achievements, the, all of these rights achievements have been the product of mass movements. And it's usually empowered elites, business, white elites, that have been the sites of authoritarian retrenchment. Mm -hmm. Which is what we see happening now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you know, there have been different solutions offered by the left to reduce the power of the court. And not just the left, I mean, there's some segments of like the liberal center, if you will, that have, put, have yeah. you know, put forward some of these solutions, not of course the leadership of the Democratic Party, but some of these solutions include things like term limits, or of course we keep hearing about increasing the number of judges, uh, requiring greater, you know, um, unanimity. But can any of these actually work? We've also heard, you know, on the left, people talking about abolishing the Supreme Court. You know, could any of these, in your opinion, work? Well, I mean, so the thing that I think is interesting is that there is a kind of emerging left and liberal agreement on a set of reforms that affect both the courts and also voting rights. And I, you know, I do think that these reforms are absolutely worth defending if you're a person on the left, maybe for different reasons than a liberal. A liberal might like these reforms because they see them as ways to prop up a constitutional system that folks are still committed to. If you're a person on the left, you might see these as I do as, you know, potentially what's called by my colleague Amna Akbar, non-reformist reforms, so that there are ways to... Uh, to slowly transform the landscape of American institutions in, in a matter that can produce even more thoroughgoing transformations to state and economy. Um, and in theory, they, they can be passed, I think, through legislation. The nature of Article 3 of the Constitution, which deals with the federal judiciary, is that it's incredibly vague and open-ended. It's only a few hundred words, and there's a lot of space that, within which you could imagine uh, Congress operating. So Congress has the power to establish what are called, quote unquote, inferior courts, so lower courts. There's no, nothing in the text of the Constitution that says that there need to be nine justices on the Supreme Court. There's nothing in the text of the Constitution that determines the voting rules on the Supreme Court for what laws would be passed or whether or not the legislature might have a legislative veto. So you could, for instance, have Congress sort of establish more federal courts have the judges that are on the federal courts, because there is language about lifetime tenure, circle into and off of the Supreme Court. So you can have a much larger Supreme Court and you can have term limits on the Supreme Court, even if your appointment to the federal bench might be for longer periods. You can imagine a type of legislative veto that Congress could pass that would limit or constrain what the court does. You can imagine rules that require super majorities. And then you can do all of this alongside uh, changes to voting rights. So the the Voting Rights Act uh, could be further strengthened. This is something that's part of the Democratic Party leadership's stated um, uh, positions. I also think probably even more important than that is changing congressional districts or equally mm -hmm. important 
So you can move away from single member districts to multi-member districts that would undermine the kind of uh, unrepresentative stranglehold that the Republican Party can wield over even the House and can produce a much more representative system that's all within the power of Congress. So there's an agenda. The problem is much of this agenda is beholden to how unrepresentative Congress is. So it makes it very hard to get this passed. And then right. even let's say if you made these judicial reforms alongside ethics uh, reforms to the nature of the court, it might still end up having to go to the court to assess its constitutionality. So there's a kind of catch-22 that the constitutional system imposes on the changes. Mm -hmm. The changes are there, but the system makes it very difficult to actually implement them. Yeah, and you know, and that speaks to one of the biggest problems in our system. And it's interesting because you know, I've lived outside of the US for several years now, so it's easier for me to observe this um, I think outside of it, but also those of us on the left know this just from being on the left. Americans really do view their country through this like myth of steady progress and this pursuit of liberty and equality and human rights and justice and prosperity. And of course, like people are often willing to admit the mistakes of their country, right? We made mistakes, but they treat the system of it's, it's like this culmination of human political achievements and it just needed some minor adjustments, right? Like giving people like like living, giving black people the right to vote or something. Uh, but in fact, you know, wouldn't you say, and I know you've made this argument that our vaunted system is not a model for others to emulate. It's actually designed to be conservative and to be anti-populist and to support minority rule and to maintain the power of ruling elites. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I certainly agree with that. And I think one of the ways that you can just see this play out is that as a practical matter, the, the, the US federal constitution just hasn't been a model. So it diverges pretty dramatically. So there are uh, some scholars, Mila Versteeg and Emily Zakin that have written about this, that it diverges pretty dramatically from state constitutions in the US. So that when settlers in the 19th and in the 20th century had the opportunity to write their own state constitutions, they did not use the federal system as a model. They created systems that were much more democratic, much more connected to majoritarian politics. That's why state constitutions look so different. They have far more extended rights. They're easier to amend. They look more like legislative documents. They're much longer. The US Constitution, 7,000 words. The state constitutions are longer. And then you see the same thing globally. The average length of a global constitution around the world is 20,000 words. The Indian constitution is 150,000 words. And by and large, just like at the state level, the US federal constitution has not been um, followed as a, a mechanism for instantiating representative institutions or judicial power. And I think it plays out in ways small and large. So you can even see this in the context of reproductive rights and the, the particular struggles that are taking place right now. So since 2000, there have been 39 countries around the world that have altered their laws when it comes to reproductive rights. There are only two of those 39 that have altered their laws in a, ways that, in a way that makes reproductive rights harder to defend. And that's the US and Honduras. And you can say, well, this is a function of global trends, which is, I think, the global opinion, just like the domestic opinion, is in favor of abortion rights. There's a recognition that abortion rights are essential to women's equality and freedom. But it's also a function of representative institutions, which is that the lack, the, the fact that we, we're seeing a pushback in the US speaks to the de-democratization that marks uh, Amer the American constitutional process and the, the relatively more representative nature of institutions globally speaks to in many countries, speaks to the fact that you've seen the expansion of reproductive rights elsewhere. And it also, I think, gives a lie to one of the most common arguments that we've seen post Dobbs made by both conservatives on the court and elsewhere that, hey, this is just leaving these questions to the democratic process. Mm. That's not what's in fact happened. If we had anything like a functional set of representative institutions on abortion, just like on a host of issues, we probably would have landmark legislation that establishes the right. And we probably would also have a constitutional amendment for abortion rights. The reason why we don't have those things is because the representative institutions are so undemocratic and then power is essentially being funneled into a court that because of those dynamics, 
gives massive unbalanced authority to a, a far right where you know background opinion says that over 60 percent support abortion rights and that the position taken by those on the court has at most a third of national support so all of these are reasons why both we're seeing a slide toward uh, more authoritarian practices domestically but also why rather than a model globally the u.s constitution is really a kind of artifact in many ways of the 18th century yeah. And I want to get into that as well. But, you know, our, our constitution, our constitution also, like it makes it so difficult for popular sentiment to shape laws for the reasons that you've stated. And like you said, like amending the constitution is so freaking difficult. Um, can we achieve through legislation what we failed to achieve through litigation? You kind of alluded to this with the um, abortion rights uh, example. Yeah. I mean, I, I think absolutely. And really the, again, as I've said, I think the story of entrenching law that is democracy enhancing and rights protecting in the US is a story of mass mobilization and popular, popularly co codified law, either through legislation or, or amendment. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, 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 in theory, I think that's absolutely the case. The problem in the US is that we pile super majorities upon super majorities. In other words, Getting something passed through Congress that would represent, you know, a, a supermajority of the public requires massive institutional control by the Democratic Party. So it means dealing with the gerrymandered House mm -hmm. and the nature of the Senate, where because of state-based representation, having a majority in the Senate for the Democrats really means having a supermajority. And then if you put uh, the filibuster on top of that, you're essentially requiring a supermajority of the supermajority. And so the representative system's paralysis <sighs> is what makes the legislative solution really hard. And it's telling that the times when there's been a break in that paralysis, and here we can really think of that period from the 30s to the 50s, was a, was an, was a special era because of how much popular support the labor movement was able to infuse in the Democratic Party. So the 1936 election, so th this is when FDR wins re-election. It ends up sort of entrenching the New Deal order. Labor support meant that FDR had what effectively amounted to 80% plus support in both the House and Congress. Wow. You know, that is really historically unique, but it's the kind of setting that you need for the electoral institutions basically to function adequately. And really, in a way, since the 30s, what we've been dealing with is a kind of effort to preserve a certain set of achievements as the country has moved back into a much more familiar pattern of polarization. Mm -hmm. um, That's like unthinkable today, the idea of having 80%. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah FDR wins re-election in a landslide that at that point had only been matched by a, an election for for you know Monroe of the Monroe Doctrine, where he basically ran unopposed. So you need to have such massive popular coalitions, um, and, and I think this is a real this is a real problem. It's also one of the reasons why. Look, look, I am absolutely not a fan of the Democratic Party leadership, and I think they've been very late to the game in terms of realizing that the modern Republican Party is not their sort of fictional imagination of. Uh, that's that's sort of even maybe that's yeah. even be, maybe being a little too generous because I don't even think some of them have gotten to that point where they recognize that. But yeah, please continue. But I, but I guess the point that I'd make is that I think one of the things that we deal with is that it's not like the Republicans, you know, either McConnell or Trump are these political savants that just go from kind of genius strategic decisions to genius strategic decisions. Actually, right. they're pretty profoundly incompetent, beholden to a donor class without an agenda that has mass support. And even in a context like 2020, honestly, where if you look at the dynamics around the world, Trump should have won re-election because most people were not blaming incumbents at that moment for the pandemic. They right. still kind of lost. But the reason why they seem like they're, they're genius strategists is because of the institutional dynamics that give them such a kind of cushion to essentially make political errors and not to have to worry about building majority. Where right. for the Democrats, that even though you have 
a popular majority behind a popular legislative agenda, you know, from economic issues to reproductive rights to even questions on race, that you have to be so perfect in terms of threading the needle and you have to have such luck in terms of the composition of who ends up in the Senate that it, it makes it very hard, even under the best of circumstances, to succeed. And that mm -hmm. sort of disconnect has another really deleterious consequence because it then feeds disillusionment. It feeds the sense that, well, we did vote for the Democrats, but they couldn't do anything. And so it just produces this cycle of disaffection, crisis, and then further lurching to the political right. Then why is it that like the Constitution, it's so bizarre, only in America is the Constitution treated like it's this like sacred te text, you know, delivered by like a deity or something. Um, it's, it's like we have to, we're like forced to revere from like a very young age, we're forced to revere this extremely anti-democratic Constitution that blocks policies, which are popular and blocks change. And this leads me to the question I want to ask you is, you know, You've claimed that the Constitution was actually count a counter-revolutionary document meant to curtail and limit popular energy and that it helped sustain feudalism. So can you explain what you mean by that uh, and how it like prevents any transformative policies by design? Yeah. So, I mean, if you go back to the, the late 18th century and the, the writing of the document, the folks that participated in the writing of the document, in particular, you can think of Madison, but also Hamilton, who, uh, much to my chagrin, has been re rediscovered in a way that is wildly out of step with his historical so meaning as a figure of uh, a multiracial immigrant nation, when in point of fact, he was an expression of a very elite brand of settler colonialism. But in any case, the folks that wrote the text of the Constitution were, were little R Republicans in that they were committed to the idea that a just society is one in which individuals have enjoy economic independence and some degree of political participation. Uh, they combined this notion of internal freedom with really extreme forms of external subordination and power, the expropriation of indigenous lands, the subordination of black and slave labor in particular as a condition for internal settler uh, equality and freedom. And they also had a very specific account of what the sources within settler society were that would promote um, what they viewed as despotism. And they were especially concerned about poor settlers. In other words, that you'd have majorities of poor settlers through democratic institutions like houses of representatives that would run roughshod over property rights. And so they saw the primary threats to republicanism as popular majorities combined with the politicians that they would elect. Mm -hmm. And so they created a, a setting, an institutional framework that really fractured the one tool that poor and working people had, which is the power of the vote, made it very difficult to use that vote to effectively change policy, and then placed all sorts of constraints too on their effective representatives. So that's the nature of the system. Now, the thing that's really striking about the 19th century is that in many ways through large chunks of the 19th century, the problems with this system, you know, were not experienced as concretely on the ground because the society was largely a decentralized society. And so what happened in your own local community mattered a lot more than what happened in the federal government. And when it came time for white settlers to write their own constitutions after expropriating indigenous land and transforming territory into territory for um, uh, for white labor and business, they wrote constitutions that didn't look anything like the federal constitution. And what that did is it produced a politics in which venerating the document could be disconnected from some of these anti-democratic features. So hmm. in the early 19th, early mid 19th century, there was absolutely a culture of deifying the text among various notables, both at the local and the national level. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is one of these, one of these people. But in a way, what they were doing in making it an almost religious document is they were showing a kind of allegiance to the, to the revolutionary era. It's a way of kind of asserting the specialness of a group of people and connecting uh, notables 
in the early and mid 19th century to folks in the late 18th. Mm. The real issues with this constitutional system only start to emerge in the context of the Civil War, where it becomes apparent that the Constitution is not an effective way of dealing with issues of slavery or the relationship between state and national authority. Um, in fact, it is, it you know, my view, it is a, it's fundamentally a pro-slavery compact in its function and ended up facilitating uh, white, uh, white power of enslavers and then compromising reconstruction. And then also in the late 19th century, as the country becomes a much more national uh, polity and decisions about the economy are made at the national level, then these anti-democratic features really become significant. And it's why the late 19th, early 20th century is a period of sustained criticism of the constitution and sustained desires to experiment with new institutional frameworks. It's so weird. Cause like even today, I just, it, it, it's so weird when you have people arguing over, but the constitution meant this, but the constitution meant that it's like, why does it yeah. even matter? It was written so long ago. Well, like there's no other place in the world that looks to, unless it's like a theocracy that looks at some sort of like religious document that looks yeah. to it. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize for, for interrupting. No, 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 please, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that story, the story of why, you know, liberals, folks like Obama are so invested in the Constitution is really not the story of the founding and the story of the 19th century. It's a 20th century story. Mm -hmm. And th this is an argument that I'm developing in a, in a book I'm writing, which is that it has a lot to do with the U.S.'s emergence onto the global stage when the U.S. emerged onto the global stage. So the U.S. becomes a global power in the first half of the 20th century at a time of, of like the, the collapse of the imperial system and the rise of uh, assertive anti-colonial resistance movements across the global South. Mm -hmm. And Americans have to think through, well, what is it that justifies American power? And why is the US not just like all of these other European empires? And a significant argument that gets replicated across the political establishment is that where other European empires are motivated by a principle of extraction and conquest, exploitation, the U.S. is motivated by a principle of constitutionalism. And so its internal practices mean that its interests are the world's interests. What it promotes on the global stage is this capitalist, democratic, and constitutional model. And it's why, you know, interestingly, the moments of real constitutional veneration are often tied in the first half of the 20th century to war. So 1917 sees the first efforts at celebrating Constitution Day, where you have mass veneration of the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is rediscovered as the U.S. enters World War II. And then it's especially World War II and the early Cold War that kind of solidifies this faith in the Constitution. Not only is the Constitution the thing that the U.S. promotes abroad, it's the thing that has kept the U.S. from replicating the versions of totalitarianism seen in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. And then all of that gets further entrenched by the dynamics of the Warren Court and Brown versus Board of Education. And it's meant that, you know, for most Americans, the only world that they've ever known, like you have to be almost a hundred years old to go back to a world that didn't deify the constitution in this way, is a world in which the US is hegemonic globally and in which that hegemony is tied to the specialness of the constitution as essential to our freedom and also the thing that protects us from you know, various forms of tyranny. And it's why even liberals today, this is the last point I'll make, are so divided in how they're thinking about the constitution. There's a kind of internal conflict where you'll notice that my views about the constitution, you know, which I've been making basically my entire adult life, made me a, an extreme kind of political dissident Mm -hmm. uh, as recently as 10 years ago, and now amount to a conventional wisdom among liberals. It's not unusual for a fairly conventional centrist liberal Democrat to voice similar views about the Constitution, because there's a kind of recognition. You just look at the institutions. The institutions are are fundamentally undemocratic in, in, their, um, in their genesis and effect. But at the same time, you still see, and this is the the internal uh, tension that Trump has brought up. So Trump, there's a recognition that Trump is a product of the minoritarian dimensions of the constitutional system. But there's also this continual tendency 
to say that the thing that's going to protect us from Trump is the Constitution. <laughs> right. Impeachment. <laughs> Being true to our constitutional principles. What's wrong about Trump is that Trump is not an American constitutionalist. And it's, I think, that, you know, that conflict that's in the heart of American liberalism that's part of why contemporary American liberalism, you know, essentially seems so at sea in making sense of how to confront the specific dynamics of the present. Yeah, that's going to be an, an amazing book, uh, and we're going to have to have you back on when that comes out. But, you know, since the Constitution does really enshrine the rule of an economic elite and liberals are a part of that economic elite, like it also benefits them, too, in a way. Right. Like it's like it's it's all the contradictions you just mentioned, plus the fact that, like, if you're a liberal economic elite or you're a part of that club, you also need the Constitution to maintain your own power. I don't know if they recognize it that way, yeah. but. Well, you know, I, I think a way, I mean, yeah, I, I, so I absolutely agree. And I think one of the the implications is that we have representative institutions that are not just like a, a photo snapshot of where the public is or, you know, expressive of the views held by m mobilized majorities. They're essentially fed through all of these veto points and constraints in a way that fractures, again, the one thing that poor and working people have, oppressed communities have, which is the vote. And at the same time, really expands the influence of particularly business, corporate, and conservative elites. Because if you have access to wealth, to other kinds of material and cultural resources, you can use all of these veto points between the state and the national government within the structure of the, the federal government to essentially ensure that your interests are met. Um, you can pr promote what amounts to a kind of rule by oligarchy, which was the criticism that socialists and many progressives made in the early part of the 20th century. And then that, of course, ends up shaping the nature of the coalition, even within the Democratic Party. Uh, that there are reasons why the Democratic Party's coalition, not exclusively tied to the constitutional system, but you know, since we're talking about constitutional structure, why that Democratic Party coalition has been so closely wedded with a version of American capitalism. Mm -hmm. And it also then has all of these implications for foreign policy, which is, you know, even in the 30s and 40s, when the labor movement was strongest, it's still noteworthy that American foreign policy was market driven and built around the promotion of market access and business interests. And here again, you can see how the stranglehold of corporate and security elites ends up shaping the version of Americanism that gets promoted abroad. And then that version not only has these terrible del deleterious effects for global communities in terms of ultimately entrenching neoliberal austerity, destroying uh, elements of authentic left politics, but it then has these reverberating implications for the terrain of domestic political struggle, where what the U.S. promotes abroad comes back home in terms mm -hmm. of constraints on labor organizing, the footloose nature of corporate rights, the kind of militarized form of policing that is deeply tied to the type of interventionist politics the U.S. engages in elsewhere. And I mean, just the, the idea of elections and democracy, I mean, have elections, do you think, lost their meaning in the U.S. and the world if increasingly they don't change anything? And there's really little or no popular participation in decision making. I mean, I think there was a study out of Princeton a few years ago that actually showed that the average American voter has almost no actual say in the decisions that get made. It's really just economic elites. I, so I do think when people talk about the sort of the decline of the American century, quote unquote, or the end of the post-war order, you know, they're not, we're not really talking about the the end of American power. So U.S. power is still, uh, you know, it's still dominant um, yeah. and that the U.S. has a tremendous capacity through its dollar hegemony, the fact that the U.S., um, the, the U.S. currency is the backstop of the global financial system through its military authority and interventionist practices to really project power. But I do think one of the things that's happened is that the American model that was associated with the Cold War and that sort of has extended basically until quite recently of, uh, you know, combining 
liberal constitutionalism with market capitalism as a way of promoting uh, peace and prosperity everywhere, you know, is it has is really facing profound internal and external crises. It's very hard to sustain the idea that the American model is a pathway to meaningful improvements for people here or elsewhere. Now, to me, I think that that actually has to really be disconnected from the question of democracy and elections. So, you know, I'm a democratic socialist. I believe deeply in the project of um, representative government, representative institutions. I don't think elections are the only way of getting social change. I think that elections operate alongside lots of other forms of mass organization and protest and institution building that happens um, beyond the, 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 hall, the halls of government. But, you know, I, I think that elections are really central, in my view, ultimately as a practical matter to any transformative domestic or global change. The well, issue so is we have ahead, not sorry. tried it in the U.S. <laughs> and yeah. the extent to which elections have become bound up with a specific variant, essentially, of capitalist politics is a huge problem. And we see these de de-democratizing trends, you know, pretty much everywhere. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I guess, so let me put it this way then. Is the U.S. a democracy? So my, my own view is that, no, the U.S. is not a democracy. It has never been a democracy. It's, its legal political system is not organized around, in my view, the central principle of democracy, which is um, that decisions are supposed to reflect the, the will of organized and popular majorities. Now, it has had really significant moments of democratization, which is something that is, that's different. And, um, you know, we can think of Reconstruction as a significant moment of democratization, the extension of the vote to women as a significant moment of democratization, the entrenchment of the working, of a white working class, but the working class through labor protections in the 30s and 40s as a moment of democratization, the civil rights movement as a moment of democratization, the, the extension of inclusive protections to a variety of other communities on the basis of gender, sexual orientation, um, as all moments of democratization. But the problem in the US, in my view, is that the underlying infrastructure of the country has combined two features. One is uh, an historical grounding in settler colonialism that links internal freedom to external projects of exclusion and subordination. And we can see this in you know, tradition in a way that expands from Andrew Jackson and Jefferson all the way down to the present and Trump, maybe the most powerful tradition in American life. Mm -hmm. And then the second is a constitutional system that has made it very difficult to actually uproot these sort of institutional infrastructures and gives a massive thumb on the scale to the preservation of various forms of minority rule. Yeah, and that's, yeah, I mean, our colonial legacy <laughs> is so important to understanding the sort of political order that we have today in that sense. But, you know, there is similar to the sort of constitutional uh, story that we tell ourselves. There's also a story that we tell ourselves that, yes, we've made these blunders, but we are a force for good in the world. Right. The essential nation that spreads liberal internationalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, America promotes the rule of law, this post-World War II order, and all these things. But of course, much of the world perceives America, you know, as this rogue state right now, which is like running roughshod over the weak and trampling over the rules that it claims to defend. So you already alluded to this a, a bit, but I'd like you to elaborate. Do you think our foreign policy is a result of our political and economic system? It, it, absolutely. So I think that we have a political and economic system that is entrenched through a vast array of institutions. We've been focusing on the, cons the institutions developed by the constitutional system, but not only those, so legal, political, as well as economic institutions that have tended to give authority to a particular corporate and security elite that has views about the national security you know, project that are quite distinct from um, views either held by majority of Americans 
or in my view, or would would ensure equal and effective freedom for all folks domestically. And so that's in, that's essentially what's been projected abroad. And then it's also been combined, I think, during the period really since the 1940s of American global dominance with a specific way of thinking about the U.S.'s role in the world. So on the one hand, the focus on the U.S. as a constitutional project, and so therefore not imperial, led in the 40s to the development of all of these different multilateral institutions. You can think of the UN, but not just the UN as part of this framework, where you're supposed to have shared global decision-making that represents the constitutional principle. But then there's also the sense that, well, wait a second, for the system to work, there needs to be somebody that can act as a protector preserver of the system. And the thought was that, well, the US, because its essential truth is a commitment to liberty and equality, its essential principle is a constitutional principle, its interest of the world's interests, it should enjoy this international police power to be able to step inside and outside of the rules. They're rules that we help establish, that we primarily abide by, but that to make sure the system works, we should also be able to step outside of the rules. And my own view about it is that during the Cold War period, this pretty fatally compromised the idea of the U.S. as a safeguard of a multilateral order that served the interests of all. Because if you have a national security apparatus that is making choices about when to step inside and outside of the rules, then what you end up having is a continuous reversion to various forms of carrot, maybe development assistance, but a lot of the stick of intervention, mm -hmm. all in the name of upholding this overarching system. So you engage in mass violence in places like Vietnam as a way of saying that what you're really doing is safeguarding the system as a whole. And this has become the kind of defining feature of American global power. And it's played out in the post-Cold War period in an even more intense way, in a sense, because without the competitor of the Soviet Union, American unipolarity was essentially unleashed. And so the story of persistent rule defection became really a defining feature of how the U.S. has operated really all the way down to the present. Um, and so that produces a way of behaving abroad, but then it also has all of these rippling effects mm -hmm. for how domestic politics ends up operating. If you have a system that's premised on the impunity, essentially, of state actors to engage in global violence, unsurprisingly, you're going to have a great deal of impunity of those same state actors to engage in local violence all the way down to the police officer in the context of um, city politics. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question for you is, you know, the way that foreign policy affects our high levels of internal violence. And I, I want to get your take on this because mass shootings have been in, you know, such a big topic because they just keep happening. But do you think our unique pro proclamation liberty for mass shootings can be connected to our domestic or foreign policies in that sense. Yeah, I mean, so I think there's there's lots of different reasons for it, you know, some of which that we've touched on, the militarization of mm -hmm. American foreign policy and its implications for the militarization of domestic life, um, the nature, uh, again, of our representative institutions that make uh, policies that have mass support very difficult to actually implement. But one thing that I think is less discussed that I thought I could just sort of add to the conversation, yeah. it, you know, has to do with that specific settler colonial history, which is if you look at most countries around the world, that they're essentially organized, the, the construction of the nation state form is organized around the idea that the state should have a monopoly on the exercise of violence. And, you know, I'll say like, this is, there are all sorts of problems with this. I'm, an internationalist. I'm not a fan of the nation state form. I think it's done a lot of global uh, violence over the course of the 20th century. But there's a reason why, for instance, you know, countries like Japan, but not just Japan, many countries, it would be it would be very hard to imagine a circumstance in which you had mass possession of firearms, like in the U.S. with their 400 million firearms that circulate in the country. More firearms than people. Yeah. yeah so which, which is fundamentally antithetical to how 20th century states were constructed, which is 
the government controls the exercise of violence, not mm -hmm. citizens. The U.S. is a project of settler colonialism and of a very specific kind of settler colonialism. This is something that a, a wonderful political theorist, uh, Dara Grant, has written about, which is that the way that the U.S. expanded across the continent was through the decentralization of uh, of imperial power. So it wasn't like, you know, again, this sort of ties to why folks weren't that upset with the federal constitution and its problems in the early 19th century. It wasn't like you had a nation state government, a central government in DC that is just determining how, um, how expansion operates. This was largely decentralized. It was organized at the local level. And that means that in a way, the exercise of violence was privatized. So it wasn't like a single government that has a monopoly. And you can think of this even in terms of the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. So, you know, it's a public, it was meant to be a collective and public right tied to a specific militia. But the reason why militias were supposed to have this right is, you know, it's tied to notions about who's carrying forth the settler project, who's supposed to exercise violence and power in the context of conflicts, in particular with indigenous peoples and, in, and enslaved black workers. And all of that basically spread, you know, a, a culture that treats the relationship between the exercise of violence and state power really differently than what would be common in the 20th century. And then that also, I think, has been overlaid, frankly, in American history with, with white supremacy. In other words, with this idea that we have law and order, but law and order is structured around who's included and who's excluded. And so you have law and order for some and various forms of coercive violence for others. And that shapes, I think, the nature of, of these institutions. So security politics, policing, and on and on. And I mean, to that to that measure, you know, the U.S. Obviously, a lot of us know the U.S. has, I think, like what five percent or so of the world's population. Yet it's home to twenty five percent of the world's prisoners. Why is the U.S. rate of incarceration so high? Yeah, I mean, so um, this is not something that I'm necessarily an, an expert on, uh, but I, you know, I would say that this particular history, which is one of really the extreme and decentralized use of violence as a way of controlling and suppressing subordinated dependent populations, has a direct connection to practices of policing and incarceration. I will say, though, that they're really interesting historical moments of shift. So that one thing that actually differentiates recent years by comparison with the late 19th century is that actually in the South, you had relatively low rates of incarceration of mm -hmm. previously enslaved Black workers. So this is something that a terrific sociologist, Christopher Muller, has done work on, where he notes that the, the intersection basically of white supremacy, decentralized violence, and especially labor markets ended up shaping incarceration developments. So that was a moment where former kind of enslavers, the planter class, wanted to have access to black work. And so they didn't necessarily want to have a population that is incarcerated because you want to ha have access to coerced labor. Right. The story of rising incarceration rates has a lot to do with shifting circumstances that ended up meaning that rather than an interest in having access to labor, you're trying to effectively exclude certain folks from a labor market. So you had higher rates of black incarceration in the North and the South in the 1920s to the 1940s because of labor competition. And then you really see the dramatic escalation of incarceration rates starting in the 1960s and 1970s and that has a lot to do with, one, the transformations of the American economy, which means that now you have essentially populations of poor and working class folks that don't have access to jobs in tra traditional industrial sectors, combined with the reality of really urban protest and revolt in the late 1960s that creates a kind of racialized sense of threat. And mm -hmm. so all of this ends up promoting a dramatic escalation of incarceration rates. But really interestingly, rather than thinking of this as mass incarceration, it's what somebody else named um, Louise Wacant has called hyper incarceration. In other words, it's not just that 
you know, anybody at random could find themselves incarcerated. Right. It's very specific populations that intersect race and class. So, um, so I, I apologize for referencing all these academics, but there's no, another, no, no, it's important. So yeah, the, there's another <laughs> person, uh, uh, two authors, Becky Pettit and Bruce Western, that have written on this. Where if you look at the cohort of people that were born between 1975 and 1979, so at really the moment where you see the explosion of incarceration rates, or that are dealing with the effects of this explosion, they're clear racial disparities. So if you graduated from college and you're a black man, your chance of being incarcerated at some point in your life is 6%. If you're a white man that, that graduated from college, your chance is 1%. So that's six, six times difference. Wow. If you did not go to high school, your chance of being incarcerated if you are a, a black man is 68%. Whoa! And, but then, but this is the interesting thing. If you were a white man and you didn't go, uh, you didn't graduate from high school, your chance of being incarcerated is twenty eight percent. So it Quite tells high. me that yeah, yeah. there's this overlap of race and class mm -hmm. that becomes a population that the carceral state is central, essentially, to policing. It's a it's a system of policing and governance, and it's also emerging precisely with the rise of the modern American right and the way that that's shaping both political parties and the decline of the mid 20th century social welfare framework. So that the way that you're governing and policing these populations is precisely through a system of entrenched state violence. Yeah, I think I've heard it phrased as like a warehousing of what's considered surplus humanity or I guess like surplus labor that you don't that the system no longer can employ. Um, and it's absolutely horrific, but those numbers are just like completely staggering. And of course we know that people in the U S who are incarcerated, unlike in a lot of other developed countries don't have the right to vote. And many of them carry that the, the, those stripped away rights after they've actually served their time, right. It's felon disenfranchisement. So that's just one aspect of who can't vote in America, but do we actually have universal suffrage? We like to pride ourselves on that, but... <laughs> no, I mean, I, so I, I'm, um, I think one of the most significant democratizing reforms that is a, itself a kind of non-reformist reform that would have tremendous implications for sort of transformative change in the country is actually making good on the idea of universal suffrage. And so that begins, for example, with ending um, systems of felony disenfranchisement. But I think it also means going far beyond what in recent years we've thought of as the boundaries of voting rights. So for instance, I'm a strong defender of moving toward non-resident voting rather than, than citizen-based um, citizen voting. And I think this actually goes to the heart of what's one of the kind of critical elements, if we're thinking about Jim Crow, of modern instantiations of Jim Crow. So in the through large chunks of the 19th century, you didn't actually have to be a citizen to vote. That the majority of states and territories in the U.S. provided for non-citizen voting if you declared your intent to naturalize as a U.S. citizen, even if you didn't end up becoming a U.S. citizen. That was very closely tied to the project of essentially European settlement. So that, you know, it was really significant that you could be Black, Indigenous, Mexican, a formal citizen and not have voting rights, but Asia, uh, Asian American, but you could be a European non-citizen who is understood as part of the settler project and enjoy voting rights. One of the things that happens over the course of the 20th century is that the US approach becomes much more like what you see with other countries elsewhere where you get rid of non-citizen voting and then you expand the terms of which citizens can vote, but in ways that still produce really profound pockets of legal and enforced discrimination. So that you have a significant chunk of the American population, you can think of undocumented immigrants, who are permanently in the US because of the nature of our immigration policy, engage in essential labor, as the pandemic made clear, to the maintenance of our economy, but have essentially no meaningful legal protections or political voice that always live under the cloud of potential deportation. Mm -hmm. And if you just think of that structure 
which is a racialized structure since it's overwhelmingly folks that are Latinx, that that marks really profound similarities to how labor entrench labor and the denial of political representation entrench Jim Crow uh, 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 subordination for for black people in the late 19th, early 20th century. Indeed, even in federal prisons, the majority of non-citizens are oftentimes housed in separate prison facilities, which are overwhelmingly Latinx in a way that replicates forms of past segregation. And just like in the past, if you're thinking about, well, how can communities that are essential to the society and yet are treated as subordinated and excluded outsiders actually enjoy something like meaningful rights and voice, the right to vote, I think, is pretty significant. So, you know, thinking about universal suffrage means not just changing the nature of the representative institution, institutions, but broadening the criteria for who we understand as our shared community and who, especially if you're on the left, you recognize as being in solidarity with. Yeah. That's well, well, very well said. And I know I've taken up a lot of your time. So just a couple more questions here. Um, and this is actually a really difficult question because I don't think anyone really has the answer, but I'd love to hear your, your perspective on this. Okay, all these faults we've talked about in the American system, elections don't seem to be working. Our two party system clearly isn't working. Um, you've said that any genuinely democratic mass movement has to begin from the perspective of radical constitutional transformation to confront these problems. Can you elaborate on that and how you think that that can actually, like, how do you think we can fix the system? Is it fixable? Yeah. I mean, so uh, I think this is a really tough question and, and it's, it's not one that I feel like there are any easy answers to certainly no easy answers that I have. Um, something that I've, I've said elsewhere, uh, which uh, unfortunately I do kind of agree with, is that the general story of empires, and I think the U.S. is part of this general history of empires, is that empires decline, and they oftentimes decline because of you know a crisis in their political class combined with a breakdown and paralysis in their institutions. Um, and so it's hard necessarily to imagine that the U.S. is going to somehow avoid a fate that is a fairly common fate. And that might be the most likely outcome, which is a persistence of these cycles of crisis, disaffection, and breakdown. But that doesn't mean that, you know, one should just throw up one's hands, that we've also seen, you know, throughout American history, really profound moments of democratic revitalization and improvement. And so, you know, I think that this moment is one that requires a similar kind of politics. For me, the way that that happens is through a mass and insurgent democratic movement. And by this, I mean a, a the development of a broad popular majority that is committed to a range of transformative changes across the landscape of American institutions from the constitution through the nature of our economic and, and racial order. It probably is gonna require kind of two things. It'll require, or certainly more than two, but here are a few things. It's gonna require some kind of party realignment that it's, it's really hard to see how the, the current party system can be compatible with these types of changes. And I think it's, you know, in the background, it was one of the things that the Sanders campaigns were attempting to sort of work through. Can you create new alignments that are cross-racial and class conscious, that are organized around shared economic interest among folks in um, working in middle-class constituencies that break free of the particular binds or dynamics of the two-party system? So some type of party realignment. And then it probably also has to go hand in hand with something else that, that I've articulated, which is really the, the, the sustained building up of left institutions, left meaning making institutions, both domestically at home and, and, and overseas. That without things like strong unions, 
uh, without, you know, strong transnational connections, without a genuinely, frankly, like desegregated American politics in which mm -hmm. people across racial divides um, in settings that are not just sort of elite settings, frankly, like universities, actually experience uh, common interests, um, common um, daily realities. I think it's very difficult to sustain and entrench uh, a, a kind of party realignment that institution building and a shift in political coalitions, that was the heart of you know the, the New Deal framework in the 30s and 40s. And even if there's lots of problems with the New Deal, something that I, you know, I've also uh, on record saying that I have issues with, that a similar combination is probably necessary. And then another thing that that would be part of this is, you know, a willingness when confronted by the difficulties of the constitutional system to kind of engage in various forms of norm breaking or norm erosion, but on behalf of the principle of democracy. In other words, to think really seriously, if push comes to shove, about um, you know, about rejecting certain presumptions, you know, from, uh, from, from the filibuster all the way to the construction of the current court system to issues about who has the right to vote that have been part of the set of norms or practices that have marked American politics over the last century, but are clearly hindrances in thinking about meaningful change. Yeah. Well, that was a very good answer to a very difficult question that I certainly don't have the answer to. And then just to come back full circle, since we started talking about the Supreme Court, uh, I thought just to end on, you know, do, you know, expanding out of the problems from the Supreme Court, is the federal judiciary system itself flawed? Well, I mean, so my own view about it is that, uh, so I, I'm not somebody that says that we should abolish all courts. And again, my basic instincts are are little de-democratic. Uh, commitment to majority rule is the driving principle. But as both a kind of concrete political matter, as well as thinking about institutions, societies, I think there's absolutely a role to play for mm -hmm. some kind of judicial framework. The problem with the federal judiciary in the US is that it replicates many of the problems that we see specifically with the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is kind of like the tip of the spear that we focus on because of the sheer amount of power that nine justices wield. But a lot of the things that, you know, we've discussed about the problems with the Supreme Court, you know, percolate across the entire federal bench. So it's why, for instance, the Republicans have been so committed to filling the federal judiciary with, ideal, you know, uh, ideological extremists because the federal judiciary, as a general matter, uh, from district courts to circuit courts all the way up to the Supreme Court, has this outsized authority that they, justice judges serve for life, mm -hmm. ethics, uh, oversight is entirely internal to the federal judiciary, the appointments process is shaped by the unrepresentative dynamics of the presidency and the Senate. The folks that find themselves on the bench form a kind of coterie from center left to far right that are deeply invested in a very specific, in my view, destructive account of the American project. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, a functioning judiciary would require fairly transformative changes and changes in line with the kinds of uh, reforms that one would want to see happen to the Supreme Court. But at the same time, there's, I think, a role to play, frankly, for courts in large, diverse, pluralistic societies alongside representative institutions that should be the primary space for constitutional politics and general political decision making. Well, I want to thank you for giving me like almost an hour and a half of your time breaking down all of these very important topics. I uh, really appreciate it. Can you let our viewers and listeners know where they can follow your work? Uh, so I'm uh, I'm not on social media. I know um, I I'm like so envious. By the way, I couldn't find you on Twitter, and I was like, okay, I guess he just doesn't have a Twitter. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, so I'm not on social media, but um, I do have a, a personal website. So it's uh, azizrana.com. I haven't updated it over the last couple months, but you can find um, a fair amount of my public writing interviews, 
uh, and, and sort of references also to, to academic pieces uh, there. Um, and other than that, you know, I'm I'm also so I you know I had somebody sort of suggest maybe the reason why I'm not on social media and maybe this is partly connected to the fact that I live in upstate New York in Ithaca is that you know I'm just out in the country. I'm sort of completely <laughs> secluded, but that's not the case. I also have email address where you can reach me through um, through Cornell University, where I'm a, a law professor, and I'm happy to to engage with um, concerned uh, folks about these range of range of issues. Well, Aziz, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it, and I hope you can come back on at some point in the future. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.